This is the panel of the day where we get to really put the test to the comment, one of the themes of uh, Professor Sankton's comments earlier today about this collaborative model being a model to watch and being preferable to those um, elsewhere in the country. Um, because we are going to have a panel full of people who are actively engaged in the nuts and bolts of trying to make this model work for our region. And so we're going to hear some uh, of some of their stories about how it does and doesn't serve our region um, today. So we're just going to wait for... Well, so I will, I will, while, while Kim is helping to load the presentations, I'll introduce the panelists and then this is a... This is a bit more of a rapid fire panel. So I'd ask the, the panelists to limit their remarks to about 10 minutes, and then we'll have t time for a bit of discussion as well. So first on my left is Sergeant doc and Dr. Kieran McConnell, and uh, he is a Sergeant with the Vancouver Police Department, as well as a professor at Kwantlen Polytechnic University has been serving for 28 years in a frontline capacity as a police officer and uh, has also served uh, on the Surrey Mayor's task, fo task Force on Gangs, so has experienced both north and south of the Fraser. Uh, beside Kieran is Evie Mustel. Evie is the co-founder and one of the principals of, of Mustel Group, one of the, well, in my opinion, the, the most credible public opinion research firm um, in the region. <laughs> um, and she has over 30 years of experience in the research industry. She also is a, a board member of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade uh, and, uh, and played a significant editorial role in the, the previous Board of Trade report that, was fe that featured uh, discussion of many of these issues that we're discussing today. Uh, beside Evie is Greg Moore. So Greg Moore just completed a term as mayor of Port Coquitlam, as well as chair of the board of directors of Metro Vancouver, and um, is now the co-founder of the Liberal Region Group of Companies. And uh, last but not least, um, Mayor Jonathan Cote, who has been an elected official in the city of New Westminster since... 2005, and uh, currently serves as a, in a reelected capacity as mayor, and is here as well as the um, as the the chair of the Metro Vancouver Board of um, uh, Transportation Translink Board. Uh, so, okay, all right, great. Okay, so do you mind if we if if we um, jump ahead of Sergeant McConnell then, and I'll accept, what I'll do is I'll ask Jonathan actually to speak first then, since Evie also wanted to use slides, and Jonathan didn't, which, so. Okay, I would be remiss to s not to say that Jonathan Cote is one of our alumni here at the Urban Studies Program. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. Uh, it's uh, a really interesting discussion and uh, I'm really happy to, uh, to be invited to, to be a part of it. Now, as someone who's an elected official and is right in the middle of uh, you know, the mix, mix of it all, uh, the question about amalgamation can actually be a little bit of a, an awkward question. I often wonder, and, and I do get the question posed to me, does would amalgamation make sense for, for the Metro Vancouver region? Um, but as someone is keenly uh, keenly aware that uh, amalgamation would, would likely mean less uh, elected officials, uh, it's it's hard to kind of divorce your own personal uh, personal role and whether I'd even e even be in, in, in such a role. But, uh, you know, I, when I do like to think about this topic, I try and hopefully be able to divorce, uh, uh, you know, that, that those those kind of thoughts and, and kind of think objectively about uh, how amalgamation would work in the region, what would be the, the benefits and, uh, and and what would be the risks and, uh, and, and some of the challenges. And I think uh, really just like, uh, you know, I think was mentioned messy was, the word messy was used about 20 times in a previous uh, presentation. Uh, I think it's it's a bit of a messy discussion as well too, because I think it's it's not black and white and it's not uh, not obvious uh, or, or clear cut uh, uh, some 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 of the advantages. Uh, I've 
had the opportunity to uh, to serve as mayor of uh, of, of New Westminster uh, for the past five years. Now, New Westminster is a, a relatively small municipality in, uh, in in Metro Vancouver, and you know I think in in that regard uh, it, it positions itself uh, really well to seeing some advantages, uh, particularly of of of, of uh, greater collaboration and cooperation between uh, between municipalities. Uh, there's no doubt uh, the larger a municipality is. Uh, there are, uh, you know, efficiencies of, of scale uh, and abilities to be able to do things that that simply can't be done from from a, from a smaller municipality perspective. Uh, my general thinking on this question, though, has has always been: as long as we're able to continue to push the envelope, continue to work and look for new opportunities to be able to collaborate, work together, share, and use regional governance. The amalgamation question, uh, you know, shouldn't shouldn't be necessary. We should be able to achieve a lot of the advantages that are achieved through amalgamation through that type of collaboration. But it's all only uh, only in that uh, in, in that format. If we are parochial, if we are very inwardly looking and we are not working together, to me, that's what actually sets the scene for how amalgamation, which is often imposed upon municipalities, comes comes to me. So, uh, you know, I think. Municipalities in the Metro Vancouver region, and I would suspect most, uh, you know, most elected officials, most councils, and even most communities who have a lot of pride in their own communities, do have a, a strong vested interest in in being able to to pursue uh, regionalism. Now, I think of you know my own experience over the last last number of years, and uh, you know I've had kind of one positive experience of, of of regional cooperation, and one that didn't didn't really work out. Uh, the first one is uh, between the, the Port Moody and the New Westminster Police Department. Now, these are both two really small police uh, police departments in, in in a metro Vancouver region, and I've always been a strong defender of having our own police department in New Westminster, in that we have had over the years some very unique challenges that. Uh, you know, in an RCMP context or even a Metro Vancouver Police Department likely wouldn't have been able to to be addressed and in, in, in there. And I think the community has has a lot of great pride in that. Having said that, when you're a community of a population of 70,000 and a hundred, less than 150 police officers, well, the economies of scale aren't aren't necessarily necessarily there. Uh, Port Moody is an even smaller uh, community with their own uh, individual police police department there. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations with uh, with 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 their department, and uh, a few years ago, uh, and this is ongoing discussions about how we can collaborate. You know, we discovered uh, that we were all individually using our own police radio system, and really, there was really no need to have a new Westminster Police Department and a Port Moody Police Department radio system. By simply the simple act of sharing the same uh, radio network between police officers, which had absolutely no impact on how even any of the uh, any of the police departments operated, uh, both cities were able to save uh, between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars a year, which is which is pretty significant. So, you know, that would be an example where, and and I think those opportunities opportunities exist all over the places where cities can 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 work work together now my next example didn't didn't quite uh, quite uh, pan out uh, it was between the city of New Westminster and, and Burnaby and uh, this was the uh, in the past term and uh, you know even though myself and, and the past Burnaby mayor didn't have the the closest relationship uh, we both recognized that uh, we were building uh, in the process of building a brand new brand new animal shelter uh, there and we could see some advantages uh, you know particularly cost effectiveness and in potentially even building uh, you know a better animal shelter that could better serve a Burnaby New West region if we were able to do it together. So uh, we both kind of started thinking about it, started having some conversations with our, our staff about that. Uh, but then ultimately, as our systems work, we both went back to our individual councils. And, uh, you know, I don't know if our councils uh, collaborated together, but the, we both got the same response back, uh, essentially saying, well, well, we're okay to look at this as long as the animal shelter is in our community and that we follow specifically our animal bylaws. Well, as you can see, it quickly uh, it quickly devolved from, from there. And to me, I, I would take that as, as a lost opportunity because I think there are certainly some areas where, you know, I think cities do, uh, you know, have a vested interest to be individual, do their own thing. And there are, are differences. And I think, uh, you know, coming from quirky New Westminster, I, I think I take great pride in, uh, in, in those, those diff differences there. But there, the reality is we do a lot of the same work uh, together. And I think there, there are, are tons of opportunities to, uh, uh, to see, see more of that collaboration together. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I guess I'm hopeful you need to get the right people in, in the room to be able to be open to, to have those, those conversations. 
Now, moving on to, to regionalism, though, and I, I think regionalism in Metro Vancouver is, is a success, success story. You know, we like to, to beat ourselves up about, uh, about TransLink or, or even uh, some of the work that, that Metro Vancouver does. But I think here as a region, we've taken a lot of core services, which would make absolutely no sense to be uh, operated or delivered by 21 different municipalities and have been able to set up a governance structure where the municipalities can come together, both at the staff level and at the elected fish level to be able to come together and, and be able to make uh, coordinated and, and collaborative uh, decisions there. And I think there's been a ton of su successes. Uh, you know, as my role as chair of the, the mayor's council, I think the development of a, of a 10 year plan, you know, you would think that would be an impossible uh, accomplishment, but 21 mayors were able to, uh, you know, with a little bit of pressure from the provincial government and, and some timelines, be able to got, get got it done and be able to to trade different regional priorities. Recognize that transit planning isn't black and white in terms of where uh, where investments and, and funding should be. There are a lot of different factors to be, but in the end, to, to get a plan that uh, that all of the um, <clears throat> all of the uh, the region was was able to to accept. So I think we've got a really good foundation from the regional level to to work on. But I think we always need to be saying, are there new elements to regional government that, that need, to, need to be looked at? Uh, we're in a changing world, uh, changing times, and there's going to be new, new opportunities. And you know, one example, and I'll finish with, uh, with this, is even the topic about uh, economic development. Uh, currently, right now, this is a function that is done individually by the 21 municipalities. Uh, the city of Vancouver probably does the most prominent role when it comes to, to economic development. Some, uh, some cities, actually many cities, actually don't do any economic uh, development but when you leave the metro vancouver region and uh, you know i'm it pains me to say this no one knows what new westminster is or the vast majority of municipalities across the metro vancouver and particularly when it comes to uh, you know uh, foreign direct investment and, uh, and and going for that with economic development, we as a region are far better of, of working working together. So this would be an example that has been a new topic that over the past past few years the region has tried to say is this uh, potentially a new regional regional model we look at. We're going through a bit of a, a bumpy process to, to be able to get there, but uh, you know I still remain some hope that uh, the region is going to be able to take that because I think it's absolutely critical that as new things emerge, whether it's economic development, whether it's tackling issues like affordable housing, uh, there is uh, definitely a, a, an important role that regionally can be done and, and do it just as effectively as could be accomplished with amalgamation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Cote. I think we're back on track for Sergeant McConnell. Perfect, thanks. So um, Chief Palmer asked me to come speak today and I was led to believe it would be mostly students and students have to come for participation grades. So I thought that most of you would be actually on Facebook or iMessage or doing something like that. So I didn't think you'd really pay attention to what I had to say. So. I'm a little bit nervous, all right? Uh, I also do apologize, you may have, I, I am, uh, I'm a cop who went and got an education and I have a PhD and it's on gangs. I run the gang unit and unfortunately we've had significant gang violence in the last 24 hours and I'm the third phone, I'm the third phone call that's made when somebody gets shot in the region. So I apologize, I hope it's not gonna go off. I've asked them not to bug me, um, but that we're, that's where we're at. I probably have the, more challenging topic, I think, because of some of the um, discussions that are occurring regionally, particularly around uh, the city of Surrey and the city of Surrey potentially leaving the RCMP model and moving to a municipal model. I wanna point out in researching this, um, <clears throat> this is probably the only book that I know on re regional policing in British Columbia, if not Canada. It's written by Chris Giacic, Forget it, I'm not gonna make it, all right? Chris is a buddy of mine, but he's also a graduate of Simon Fraser University, where he did his criminology degree and went on to do his uh, PhD in Oxford. And he has a whole chapter on integration of, of police services uh, in Lower Mainland. And he talks about the fact that um, we have 21 different police services that are policing this region today. And he suggests that if we were to be able to go back in time, we probably wouldn't have this patchwork of quilt kind of policing services. With that said, uh, I've worked on uh, I worked on the on the provincial gang team, and I saw regionalization of certain units. And I can tell you that 
despite a lot of its challenges, we, we do do a fairly good job um, with the fact that we're all on the new, I, I policed uh, in 1994 for the Stanley Cup riot. I was one of the riot officers on, on Robson Street when the Canucks um, lost uh, the Stanley Cup final. I know most of you are thinking like, People were actually surprised they were going to lose the game. I mean, really. Uh, okay, come on. That was funny. Fat guys are funny, okay? <laughs> Cut me a slack here, okay? So um, my point to that is, is in 94, we couldn't talk to the RCMP officers who were arriving on scene to help us fight this riot. We couldn't talk to them on the radio. We couldn't talk to a new Westminster police officer. So we have the radio system now where we can talk to each other. Uh, we, we share the same computer system. So I can read a, uh, in my car... On the street, I can read a file that was written by a new Westminster police officer 10 minutes ago. So we we have done lots of lots of good things. I'm not saying that necessarily we're, we're where we need to be, right? Uh, I throw this up whenever I speak. It keeps me out of trouble with the chief, uh, though I think this is a weird one because he asked me to speak, so I probably could get away with some stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, this is really my thoughts. I've been asked to come. I've been a cop for 28 years, and I've done some research in this area for sure. When I speak in America and I try to explain the role of the RCMP, it's very, uh, I sit on the, sh on the National Gang Crime Research Center out of Chicago, uh, their gang research center. And uh, I try to explain the role of the RCMP and, uh, and to the American uh, officers and the American people in the room, they're like, I don't get it. I'm like, okay, well, the RCMP are like the FBI. Like, oh, okay, I get that, the FBI, right? And they're also like our state police. They're like, what? They're like the state troopers who wear the hats and all that. They do state policing too. I'm like, yeah, they do that too. And they also do city policing on municipal contracts. And we probably here in this region see this more than anywhere else because we have the five largest uh, RCMP detachments in Canada. So we're very used to them doing municipal policing, but it is done on a contract basis. Uh, just like any other business arrangement, contracts can be renewed, contracts can be rescinded, uh, different language can be added in and all that kinds of stuff, right? But we are very unique. And Chris talks about that. We're probably actually, we're very unique for Canada, if not the world, in how we deliver police service uh, mm -hmm. in this region. So that's really what it looks like. Uh, if my PowerPoint skills were better, I would have put up municipal cops, but I couldn't figure out how to do that. This is part of another presentation. So, but if you think about that, right, I mean, and where we are today from where we were, I mean, before we went to the radio system, we couldn't, on the south end of Vancouver, we couldn't get on to a Richmond radio channel. So if a pursuit was coming from Vancouver into Richmond, they couldn't hear us. And that's no longer the case. We simply switch over and we're talking to their dispatcher right as, as easy as that. And we actually have the technology that in a pursuit, which is, you can imagine, as an officer driving the car, very difficult to fiddle around, try to find the channel, the dispatchers actually can do that in the dispatch center so the officers in the pursuit don't even have to touch the radio. So it's pretty, pretty slick, actually. Um, but that's what we look like. And we have this sort of patchwork, if you will, of, of municipal. Vancouver is a big city. It, it's one of the largest cities uh, in North America now. Uh, it has a large population. But it, the thing about it, what makes our, our particular region interesting is that while we have business districts in Abbotsford and and Surrey and all that, the core hub of the region is still Vancouver, right? We have the Granville Entertainment District with the, the bars licensing allowed to stay open till 4 a.m. And trust me, as an officer who worked a lot in District 1 of Vancouver in the bar industry, that extra two hours of drinking time does bring in the, 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 the tunnels, and, tunnels and bridges is what the industry calls them. Um, how do we deliver policing differently? The one thing that Vancouver has had to do very quickly was, taught, was consider the call load and how a call load needs to put, uh, how we need to put the most officers on the street at the same time. So one thing that Vancouver offers that other police agencies may not offer is the fact that we have more officers working on Saturday night. We, uh, we, well, we have more officers working every day of the week between 7 p.m. and 1 a.m. than any other time. And what that means is on Friday and Saturday nights, when we have a spike in our call load, we also have more officers working than say any other department that works at two days, two nights. So those departments that use two days, two nights, they have the same number of officers working Sunday morning as they have working Saturday night. And I can tell you as a police officer of almost 30 years, 
it's a much different experience working Saturday night than it is working Sunday morning. Um, and we have the RCMP who provide, so we have to look at this, the RCMP provide provincial police service, they provide federal police service, and they provide on a contract basis, municipal police service in the province of British Columbia. And we have many regional units. Uh, and I just wanna point that out to you that we, we have the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit, which I had the pleasure of working at for three years, which is essentially the gang team. Uh, URSU, which is Integrated Road Safety Unit. Those are the officers that go all over the province and they're predominantly uh, responsible for road safety and writing up traffic tickets. I hit as the Integrated Homicide Teams, and that uh, investigates all the homicides. And I think every agency except Vancouver participates in that. Uh, iSpot, which is the officers who are the surveillance teams that go out and follow uh, sexual offenders around, and that is an integrated unit as well. Uh, the JIBC, maybe some people may not see that as an integrated spot, but I, I do because you have officers from all the different agencies, including the RCMP, working there as instructors of the recruits. Uh, I said is the child exploitation team, so we have integration there as well and iMarket, which looks after the uh, stock market and has officers from, from all over. You know, this is, a, this is really where we look at the, the numbers, the, the dollars and cents. There's always the discussion is, you know, is one cheaper, one's, one's more expensive? How does that impact on potentially regionalization in the, in the, in the, in the area? Um, I think we need to look really long and hard. I wasn't gonna stand up and answer that, so I let Chris, I, I texted him this morning and said, hey, I'm gonna, put your stuff up on the board. Um, but you know, when we look at the stats, municipal officers cover about 531 residents, whereas the RCMP and municipal policing cover about 781. Caseload is 41 for municipal, 75 for the RCMP. And the cost is about 165,000 for a municipal officer. And the RCMP is about 155,000. However, as Chris points out, when you take the federal grant of 10% out, it's actually a little bit more expensive than your municipal officers. And at any time, the federal government, provincial government can call 30% of your detachment away to police provincial or, or federal issues. This is what's driving a lot of discussion debate right now, uh, whether uh, Surrey will be a municipal police agency or not. Um, there's no way until I have that first retirement check that I'm gonna stand up in front of a bunch of people and uh, mention that. I'm pretty sure I can, I'm, I'm that close, I can retire in October, so I could probably outlast any disciplinary hearing, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna bait me into this one, so. That's my contact details, if you have any questions, and I'm sure there'll be questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evie Mustel. Um, so as Meg um, mentioned, I am a market researcher. Thank you for the endorsement, by the way. Um, but I'm also here today representing the Board of Trade. Um, they produced a report um, in 2016 and 2018 um, called the uh, Greater Vancouver Economic Scorecard. It's on their website. It really makes a good read. This is the shorter version. There's a 300-page read for the academics in the room. But um, um, it really digs into a lot of um, the issues facing the region. And this last, in 2018, we uh, did a special focus on regional governance because that came out in 2016 as being a key area um, or a potential solution to some of our um, issues facing the region. So I'm just going to go through some of the Conference Board of Canada results and then hit on some of the key issues that the Conference Board really saw as uh, potentially being um, uh, not resolved but certainly assisted by having greater regional coordination. Um, okay, first of all, I'm just going to start with um, sort of the polling, polling hat I'm wearing here. Um, just some of the research that we've done shows that uh, there is support from the public for some amount of amalgamation of municipalities. Um, we found 50% of the general public uh, support some amalgam amalgamation uh, in contrast to 27% and the remainder undecided. Uh, the business community is even more supportive. Um, I think business licensing probably being a, a key factor there. Uh, politicians are a little bit more divided. So this poll was taken just before the last provincial election or the last um, municipal election and politicians includes all those who were running in that election and uh, incumbents as well as those retiring. Okay, in terms of the Conference Board of Canada, um, overall we did pretty good. Um, out of the eight um, uh, North American cities um, that they chose to rank us against, uh, mainly uh, Canadian cities, and then they picked three 
port cities along the coast that were similar to Vancouver, uh, we ranked number two. Um, so in the report, they found a lot of good um, factors or a lot of good um, points of our, our regional governance. Um, you can see Calgary's at the bottom of the list, contrary to one of the earlier speakers, and I think probably they've acknowledged that Calgary has expanded in terms of its uh, growing uh, suburbs. Um, so some of the indicators that the Conference Board of Canada looked at uh, to come up with this ranking included um, number of local governments per 100,000 population. So on that ranking, Vancouver falls you know, more in the middle at five, which is not surprising given that we have 21 municipalities. Um, and as you can imagine, I mean, really, it's the number of governments really does dictate how difficult it is to coordinate and align regional interests and agencies. Uh, another indicator, which I thought was interesting, was the number of women councillors. And it's really a proxy for inclusiveness. Um, as we know, public companies with more female representation on board of directors are more effectively managed. And you can use the same reasoning for public institutions such as municipal councils. So uh, again, this measure was taken before the last municipal election, so things might have shifted a little bit. Uh, but Vancouver ranked four out of the eight, um, uh, eight municipalities or eight uh, regions on that basis. Another um, indicator that they look at is a uh, percentage of your own source revenues as a percentage of all government revenues. Um, what they found, what the conference board suggested is that the greater financial and uh, fiscal autonomy and ability to set your own tax rates, the more likely a municipality or region is to show good governance. Uh, so Vancouver ranked third, which was, which was quite good. Uh, some of the other indicators that they looked at that aren't really um, where you can really rank actually were things like, you know, does the region have an economical, does it have a regional economic development? And here in our region, we have 10 separate municipal economic development agencies. Uh, and I think Greg's going to talk a little bit more about how we're trying to change that with some of the initiatives that Metro Vancouver is doing. Uh, in terms of regional structures, they, they look at what regional structures the area has. Uh, we have Metro Vancouver, which um, the report was very complimentary of. Um, the only one question they brought up, and again, I'll save this for Greg because I know he has some opinions on it, is whether the board of directors should be elected or appointed. Um, so that was one question in the report. Um, they looked at TransLink, which they thought very, very um, strong organization. And um, so we got bonus points for having an organization like TransLink, which all regional governments do not have. Um, so the, the Conference Board of Canada really identified as some of the key issues that could be addressed through greater regional coordination is transportation, housing affordability, availability of industrial lands, and I should add to that economic development as well. So looking at uh, some of the results that uh, they had on these issues, um, housing affordability, we, we got to see. And the way they define housing affordability was the medium house price divided by the median household income. Uh, anything above a five is considered severe. We are at 12, so we are off the charts. We are beyond severe. Um, so they really felt greater regional coordination and permitting and building could really help um, release some of um, uh, the product that will ease ease that affordability. Change in affordability, same thing as C. Uh, public transit railway network um, did not do very well. We're certainly making making some great strides with the 10-year uh, um, vision and with funding for phases two or three actually in place. Uh, but when, when the conference board compared Metro Vancouver to other um, country, other regions around the world, um, um, for example, the public transit railway network. We have less than 100 kilometers of railway network versus number one ranked Sydney, which had 974. So we are making good progress, but we've got a little ways to go. Uh, in terms of commuting, 70% of our uh, commuters uh, commute by car, which is well above what we see in many of the Asian cities. So not doing great on it, but we're certainly making some progress. Okay, just digging into housing affordability, um, this is based on a province-wide poll, but it shows you really how high the level of concern is with residents about uh, um, affordability. In the city of Vancouver, we had 91%, with 73% saying they're very concerned. Uh, same in the metro Vancouver region as well, it was uh, 58%, uh, very concerned, another 38% somewhat concerned, so very, very high. Um, in, in what we are finding, this is starting to have some significant economic impacts for the region as well. Um, 
very high proportion of people and have already, but are considering relocating away from Metro Vancouver. We found 46% of the general public and 37% of businesses are considering relocating away from Metro Vancouver. And the number was even higher among large businesses. You think, oh, maybe that's a small shop. They can just pick up and, you know, move to, you know, the Vancouver Island. No, this, we actually found the percentage over 40% of businesses with 50 or more employees. So it's having some major implications. Um, even businesses told us as well, 73% of businesses reported that they are having difficulty recruiting and retaining employees um, because of the housing issue. So really housing is very much related to transportation. Um, um, one of uh, the measures that we took was to ask, you know, are municipalities uh, planning the appropriate amount of new housing relative to transportation infrastructure? And we found that actually 68% of the public feel that their municipality has permitted too much housing. So the politicians are really caught between a rock and a hard place. While more supply is one of the solutions, they're getting major pushback from, from the, the community because they're just not getting the infrastructure. It's not even just transportation infrastructure. They're looking at things like community centers and schools you know, all the infrastructure to keep up with that. So it's it's quite quite a kind of a difficult, I don't involve any politicians' jobs these days. <laughs> um, so just finishing off with economic development, um, again, we found pretty strong support among the general public for a single economic development agency, uh, 46%. The business community, even stronger support at 67%. Uh, and right now, the politicians are, again, a little bit more divided on it, so need a little bit more convincing. But I think that's a great segue to... Um, Greg. <laughs> Thanks very much, Evie. Greg Moore. Thank you. Also proud to be an alumni of SFU just before the Urban Cities program came in, though. Back. I'm back all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this might be as close as I get to a classroom, though. Uh, so thank you so much, and, and it's my pleasure uh, to talk about sort of the risks and the opportunities uh, with amalgamation or with amalgamating or sharing services and that sort of thing. But I think one of the things that we really need to recognize, and I think it's been recognized on this panel, is there is a lot of great stuff going on that we should actually compliment ourselves and brag about a little bit more and let others learn from us instead of us constantly trying to bring in other people from around Canada and around the world to talk about what happened there. I think we should focus on best practices that are happening here. You know, Metro Vancouver, we already are, we already, uh, and I'll tell you from a politician's perspective, we already amalgamate the expensive stuff, right? Water and sewer, affordable housing, regional planning, parks, garbage, uh, transit through TransLink, even though I completely disagree with the governance model, at least it's brought everybody under one uh, one uh, building to, to drive some decisions. Um, when you're around your local government table, and the biggest debate that you have every year is probably your budget. Uh, because that forms pretty much everything that you're going to do and whether you can actually implement some of those great policies that you debated you know, six months beforehand. If you put money towards it, then you can actually do it. Uh, whether that means more staff in a planning department or more money to build more parks or recreation or whatever it is. And so when in Metro Vancouver, most, all municipalities uh, are debating those a lot more policy related items around the budget how many police officers we should have, new rec centers and that sort of thing. Because our biggest line items in our budget is police and fire and roads and then parks and rec and depending on the municipality you go to, that order will fluctuate. But if we didn't have Metro Vancouver, our biggest line items would be water and sewer and big nature reserve parks that we're trying to acquire. But we shift that all to Metro and we let them have those debates. So when we get to our local communities, we can actually debate the, the, not that water and sewer doesn't affect you absolutely every day, but those policy related community living uh, lifestyle type decisions that we make at the local level. So I think we really need to sometimes pat ourselves on the back and, and I'm really glad to see they got Chair Dollywall and uh, Mayor Cote and others on this panel to talk about what's going on really well here in Metro Vancouver. I also think that the regional governance model works really well. I would completely disagree with anyone that says you should elect people to Metro Vancouver. And the reason that it works really well is because there has to be a local connection. The local, the local um, 
council table has to be connected with the regional decision making that's going on. If you had to disconnect, all you would create is more friction, more fighting, more me too, more ward systems, more I get elected over here, why don't I pat you on the back over there so I can get that over here. Um, that connection between the regional director or directors, depending on the size of your community, and the local council table is imperative. We do it at the elected level as well as they do it at the staff level with you know, the regional CAO's table, the regional planning table, the regional engineers table. So all of our staff around the region are also constantly talking together and sharing information uh, and sharing what's going on. So everybody's kind of on the same song sheet, if you will, as they move forward. But some of the risks, I think, if you wanted to really get into a broader based discussion around uh, amalgamation of actual communities, and I think, you know, it makes sense maybe in, in certain areas, you know, when I like the amalgamation of Abbotsford and Matsqui. Really, Abbotsford took over Matsqui, uh, right? Because one was, wasn't able to deliver the services that it really needed to, and Abbotsford, in a very respectful way, could provide a better level of service. Uh, could that happen between White Rock and Surrey, the Tri-Cities, I don't know. I don't think so, but you know, sure, let someone try to figure it out. Have those discussions about what are the pros and the cons and what's gonna happen and what's not gonna happen in, uh, in a real discussion around that. Uh, but I think the real win is around uh, amalgamating more services uh, around sub-regionally and regionally. But some of the risks, when I chat with, uh, when I used to chat with some of the mayors in the Ontario area, I remember sitting down with the former mayor of, of Ottawa, who was a big amalgamation, and, and they talked about how their residents have lost connection with their local government officials. Because no longer, you know, you want to have a meeting with Mayor Cote, phone him or phone his office, and you could probably have a meeting with him in a week or so, maybe two weeks because you do the TransLink thing. You want to have him, well, it just takes him out of the office more. I wasn't complaining about it. You're, you're just, you're doing more of this stuff and you're not in your city. It was just, I was the chair of Metro for seven years. I wasn't in Poco a lot, so it took longer to get a meeting. It wasn't a slag. But uh, if you want to go have a, mayor with, or a meeting with the mayor of Toronto or the mayor of Ottawa uh, or any of those amalgamated cities, good luck. It's like having a meeting with the Minister of Environment. How long is it going to take you to go have a meeting with George Heyman? Re realistically, would it be months? If you caught him in his constituency office, maybe. So you really lose that local connection with your local uh, residents. And I think it really creates a, a larger fracture in your democracy, uh, your local democracy and your regional democracy. I remember a few years ago, I was at another SFU event and Andrew Coyne was there talking about, uh, we were talking about road pricing. And I was facilitating it and, and someone put up their hand and said, well, you know, we should do amalgamation. It would be interesting to bring in, uh, you know, in Metro Vancouver, this and that, and was sort of putting us all down and I thought it was kind of funny because I was standing right there. And then um, Andrew Coyne said, yes, but you're assuming you're gonna get the best mayor in the world to manage your amalgamated region. Or you could have the mayor of Toronto and it was under the previous mayor's term. So, you know, you sometimes are be careful what you ask for. Uh, I think in our region, you have a healthy competition between the local governments. I don't think any local government uh, for the most part is trying to do anything better uh, because of the other local governments around or in spite of. Um, I think they're just trying to do better for their, their, their citizens and their businesses. And I can tell you that as local governments, we will copy and steal the best practices that others do. Right? Most of us over the last term got asked about the, uh, the vacancy home tax that the city of Vancouver was bringing in. Are you going to do the same thing? We said, well, actually, we'll just see how that works for them. And if it works well and it achieves the goals, then maybe we'll look at it. And if it doesn't, well, they've experimented. City of Port Coquitlam, on a smaller scale, we were the first ones to bring in the garbage system, you know, the tipping garbage system that everybody has. We brought that in in 2002. I can tell you that every local government engineer and politician came to the city of Port Coquitlam over the next number of years to kick the tires to see how it worked. We were like a 20 or 12,900 single family home experiment, right? That's a neighborhood in Vancouver, but we could do it for a whole city. Everybody got to kick the tires, we got to figure it out, and now it's everywhere. So you still, you get the best, I think, of both, both worlds. But I think there are lots of opportunities to look at amalgamation. Uh, I think we could have better amalgamation of certain police services. Uh, I think we could have better amalgamation of certain integrated fire services. It makes no sense in the world to me why in the city of Port Coquitlam we have a, uh, um, what the heck is it called? High, I'm not saying it right, but 
high current rescue team, like rescuing people out of the Coquitlam River, right? The, the, the river that we share with Coquitlam, who also has the fire department trained to do high river rescue stuff, like makes no sense. We have one high rise in Poco. You know, Coquitlam's got like dozens and dozens. Why do we all have to have high fire trucks and ladders and stuff? Can't, you know, when we have shared emergency services that overlap if there's a big emergency. Um, but, you know, there seems to be, there could be some amalgamation on some of those things. Um, I will pick up on the regional prosperity initiative and the regional economic development. Uh, that was something that we tried. The Metro board actually seven years ago said that it was one of the um, main top three things that Metro Vancouver should try to achieve. And, and in the first few years of, of my term as chair, anyways, there was a lot of other stuff that we were trying to do do and, and work through at Metro. So the last, uh, I guess, three years now, we started to look at regional economic development. And what we did is we brought together um, the community. And when you think of the community on a Metro size, uh, it's a little bit different. But we brought together um, Board of Trade and the BC Chamber of Commerce, um, who you'd expect to be around that table. But we also brought together um, First Nations, labor, academia, um, I think there was a few other groups represented there um, uh, to try to have a, a broader discussion to say that, you know what, amalgamating economic development, or we like to call it regional prosperity, because if you don't fix the housing thing, you're not going to do very good in the economic development thing. So uh, we wanted to keep it as prosperity, but um, we also felt that it wasn't one sector's job to do. It wasn't, hey, you local government, go fix regional economic development. It was, well, why is the chamber or the port, or the port was there, or the port or the airport or private sector or others doing their own economic development and local governments, as Evie said, 10 local governments out of the 21 doing their own local economic development thing. That makes no sense. So we brought everybody around the table and we did a lot of great work uh, over the last couple of years. Um, but the rub came and it's, and then as Jonathan talked about, that's the rub that the new, you know, 30 out of 40 people around the, elect the Metro Vancouver board are trying to get caught up to speed because we've been doing it for a couple of years now trying to figure out how is this going to work? Why are we going to do it? What what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve uh, and is it worthwhile? We did try in the beginning though to do a couple, uh, someone gave me the advice that you know when you're doing some of these things don't always go for the grand slam and the first time up to the plate. Uh, try to get some base hits to show some, some progress towards uh, regionalization around anything really or specifically this file. And so we thought oh well we'll do two easy ones which turned out to not be easy at all. Uh, one was around the amalgamation of um, uh, mobile business licenses. So those are electricians and plumbers and, and those sort of folks that could work in 21 municipalities. Not everybody has business licensing. So I think it was about 19 municipalities and have to get 19 uh, business licenses. Or we ha and so right now we have five subregions that that do amalgamated business licenses like the Tri Cities and the North Shore and so on, but they don't talk to each other. And so we thought, oh well, how hard could this be? We'll just bring it all together and we'll create, you know, we'll do a whole back end thing because I did some quick research and tr pretended to be a a business and apply for business licenses. I don't want to say half because I can't remember exactly what it was because about two years ago or so. A lot of municipalities, uh, you literally print out a form and you have to fax in or drop off in hand your business license application. We thought this is crazy. So we'll, we'll digitize or whatever, we'll put it all online. Um, we tried so darn hard to get that to happen and we failed. And you know why we failed? It wasn't at the electoral area. We had pretty good support because we went out and did a roadshow and met with every mayor and CAO and we had pretty good support around that. It was actually around our staff level. Our business license managers uh, didn't see it as a priority, didn't, couldn't get their head wrapped around why we would do it, what was the point of doing it, uh, and all these sort of things. And so ultimately we pulled the plug on it uh, about eight months ago or so and it was really tragic. However, we did succeed in one area. Uh, we thought uh, the same thing happens with uh, regional film permits, or sorry, film permits. If you're a film permit or if you're a film manager, a site manager, you have to fill out a different permit for every local government you work in. And uh, it's a cumbersome. It takes majority of their job just filling out. And they're not like one page permits. They're long permits. And so what we did is said, hey, how about if we amalgamate all of that film permitting 
process, not the giving of the permit. That has to still be a local government decision because there's road closures, there's different things that go on that is unique to that city, but just the permitting. And so what we equated it to was uh, to try to convince our local government and our film managers in each city was, could you imagine if you went on to Amazon and you decided to buy, you know, five different things? Well, Amazon doesn't make any of them. They just bring it all together and you just press one button and you buy it and you're happy and they figure out the back end of where all the information is supposed to go and get sent to you. That was our vision for the film permit side of it, that we'll do the front end and then it'll go off to Surrey and Poco and New Westminster and all that other stuff. Um, we had great buy-in from the film industry and the motion picture industry uh, and to the success, I think there's, I can't remember, six municipalities beta testing that right now uh, and it's going really really well so that's an example of when we have the will to bring things that probably nobody in this room would think about the film permit um, but it put it this way talking about economic development i'll leave it on this the motion picture association said to us that next to los angeles which has by the way 86 local governments next to los angeles um, we would be the only jurisdiction in North America to have that amalgamated film uh, application portal and process. And they said that would be a key differentiator for us to win more business uh, from everybody else in North America that we're competing with. And so we'll leave it on a positive note there. Thanks. Okay, well, we have certainly seen from this panel this um, the concept of messiness that Alex Flynn was talking about earlier. So um, when we start to talk about the actual issues that uh, those involved in governing municipalities in our region are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis from policing to economic development to uh, transportation to housing to permitting and on and on, these things don't get easier. And I think it's, it's, it's we have definitely moved beyond the black and white solutions that we might have started out the day thinking about. So we have about uh, 10 minutes for, for questions before we break for lunch. Um, again, I'll, I'll ask you to, to please um, uh, pose your question in a brief way and then I will take a few questions and then I will field them to the panel. There. I'm just curious to know your comments about how you balance um, the transportation needs for the core urban region versus the surrounding municipalities. Okay, thank you. And there was, yeah, Yuri. Um, Greg mentioned some of the metro takes care of the big picture items so communities can take care of the low like neighborhood character and stuff. But with things we've seen, such as the housing crisis and s certain municipalities rejecting affordable housing, recent debates over transit on the North Shore, municipalities are having impacts that are impacting regional residents and citizens. And just how th that tension between local community control and character and regional needs and desires um, citizens work across regions, we live across regions. Um, how do you balance that regional need with the local control? Okay, thank you. And one more question. Yep, the gentleman in the white shirt, maybe. Uh, I do think that transportation is messy, and I can tell you why, because we have all modes of transportation and they are not all integrated. Just look at cycling, for example. Vancouver is way ahead of every other city in the region, and the other cities are sort of trying to copy it, but not. And, and then transportation in general is more fe uh, provincial responsibility. The Ministry of Transportation is in charge. If we add up all the staff in transportation, well, yeah, you'll see how messy it is. The Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, all the municipal governments, the cities have, and all that stuff is duplicating each other and trying to copy each other and try to fight with each other. Is there that's a question? That's why we don't get things done. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so, 
So definitely, I guess, some questions around the issues of um, balancing particularly different transportation needs and, and demands in different parts of the region with the existing model. Jonathan, do you want to try that one? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good question. And you know, I'm going to throw in you know, the region's land use planning into, into that discussion because I think land use and, and transportation are, are very closely closely aligned. And you know, I think the Metro Vancouver region actually has a strong history of developing long range transportation and land use plans and actually sticking to them. Uh, the regional growth strategy really, you know, it, it, the early days were in the 70 and a lot of 70s and a lot of the core principles behind our regional planning really are, are still intact today. You know, we still have regional town centers. Uh, the, the model has been, has been expanded. We're still a region that uh, protects, uh, uh, wants to protect agricultural land and, and natural, natural spaces and coordinate higher density around, uh, around rapid transit. And, you know, you may think that it, you know, it's normal that to see around rapid transit, higher intensity land uses, but, you know, you go to many other cities in, in North America and you'll ride their, their rail systems. What you often find is you're going from park and ride to park and ride. You're not going to, to transit oriented developments. And, you know, I think one of the, the big successes we've had here in, in, in Metro Vancouver is we have for many decades, uh, stuck to a regional plan that has tried to focus and concentrate our, our growth, uh, particularly in corridors that are more naturally and easily served, uh, uh, served by transportation. Now we're currently going to be embarking upon, uh, you know, kind of the next regional transportation strategies. This will be the next kind of 20, 30 year outlook for, for transportation in, in the region. And, you know, I think we're, we're in the early discussions of this, but I think we've recognized we need to get everyone around the table. So it can't just be a mayor's council translink uh, process, even though they'll be big partners, but uh, we've just recently got an agreement from the provincial government that they do want to sit at, uh, sit at the table. And I think that is a huge, uh, huge success, I, I think, for, for the region, because there's nothing more frustrating than going through a multi-year planning process, but then to have a provincial government have a, have a different take on, on an issue like, like transportation. So embed them in the, uh, in, in the process from, from the very beginning. And you know, that in itself may have differences of opinions, but it's better to have that worked at through, through the process. And the same with, uh, with Metro Vancouver. Uh, you know, the, the regional growth uh, strategy right now is, is getting close to around 10 years old. It's, it's due for uh, a bit of a refresh. It's a perfect opportunity to actually mess the, those two processes uh, together. And I think, you know, that's an example of how, how those kind of planning things need, need to be done together. Transportation is always a bit tricky, though, because, you know, it's public transit is never going to be equal. I, you know, I think if if you designed a transit service that was equal in every municipality in Metro Vancouver, it'd actually be a terrible transit service because the region is developed in a very different, different way. There's lots of different, different geographies. There's lots of different densities there. And those pl all different plays and factors as to what what levels of, of transit service uh, uh, is is appropriate, and I think every every part of the region wants to to make sure they're getting as as, as good and solid of, of transit service as possible. But there's always been good recognition that uh, you know equal transit isn't uh, isn't necessarily uh, what we should be striving for. But there has to be different different factors because you know I think the reality is if you're trying to just drive transit ridership, the vast majority of new service would end up in the Burrard Peninsula, which ultimately has has difficulties in being able to serve some of our fastest growing growing regions. So there has to be other factors beyond just uh, driving transit service. And I think Translink has done a pretty good job in developing a variety of different metrics to be able to achieve that. Thanks. And then the other question, if I can sort of broaden it out a little bit, it would be the just the dangers of, of allowing or not allowing, but the dangers of having a system in which municipalities are free to experiment and, and maybe not everybody's going to agree. Maybe not everybody's maybe not all the right issues are ever going to be tackled. Yeah, and I think it's a good question, but I think it's uh, democracy is messy. Right. If you, if, you know, if you don't want the messiness of it, I guess, you know, you could make Jonathan a dictator and then he gets to make all the decisions. <laughs> we won't have discussions like this, but he'll get to implement his vision and it'll happen like that. Um, but I don't think that's what we want. I think we want to have I think we like well, probably everybody in this room likes to roll up their sleeves and get into the messy part of democracy. And, and I think at the end of the day, it might take longer to get to those decisions, but I think you get better decisions uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I think if you want to talk about messy, let's just watch what happens in Surrey. 
um, with the, the last election, right? Uh, you touched on RCMP versus uh, city police, right? You know, I think, and you also talked about contracts, which I, good luck ever getting out of a police contract with the RCMP. It's a contract, but <laughs> it's, it's not really that well, uh, it's, it's favoring one side over the other for sure. But in the city of Port Quillam, we looked at uh, leaving the RCMP when the contract was being renewed four or five years ago, six years ago, something like that. Uh, the city of Richmond was very um, um, transparent and out there in theirs and, and the cost to leave was just astronomical. Uh, for us in the city of Port Quillam, we pay, I think it's about $14 million a year for our policing services in the community. Um, to leave, this doesn't include a building or cars or anything like that, just the operational capital cost, because you pretty much have to have two police departments during the same time, during that transition time, uh, was about 16, 17 million dollars just to transition out of the police, never mind a new building and cars and everything else that comes with it. So it made no financial sense whatever, whatsoever. So we have amalgamated policing with the city of Coquitlam and frankly it works pretty darn good. So I think the messiness, whether it's policing or transit or all these things, I think, and democracy, I think we get to watch in real time how the city of Surrey is going to struggle with that over the next couple of years. I, I'd be interested in other perspectives on the panel on that question about the experiment. And particularly, I mean, I think it might have been you, Greg, who made the point that we've done a pretty good job at following through on our regional plans in the past and, and in planning for the future in terms of infrastructure, but also services. But many would say that we're also entering a kind of new dimension for this region as well in terms of growth and a number of different political dynamics. So can we rely on that kind of approach to continue to work? Any thoughts? Sergeant McConnell? <laughs> I think that... I, I agree. I think, you know, we live in a democracy and I think the, the democratic process is spoken in Surrey and the, the mayor ran on a pretty clear platform of what he wanted to accomplish and he won the election. So uh, I think that, um, I think we're, it's going to be some, interesting times and and uh, there will be a cost associated for sure absolutely there will be uh, but i think at the end of the day the public has said to the mayor that they would like to try a new approach to policing in surrey and that is the best you're going to get out of me at this stage in my career i'll jump in because i don't need anybody's vote or i don't have a pension <laughs> or anything like that um what's what's interesting about that democracy and, the, and that vote was you know, we know that there was three mayors running. They pretty much split the vote, all three of them, and, and he came up the outside of the middle or however you want to describe it. But when you only get a 35 or whatever percent voter turnout and you only get 30 percent of that, really, what did he get? Like 12 percent of the population give him a mandate? Um, this is a this is a probably one of the biggest decisions Surrey is going to have to make. So, you know, and I'm, I'm after going through the transit referendum, I am no fan of referendums to make these type of decisions, but um, there has to be, I think, you know, I, first of all, I don't think this is gonna happen in this term. So I think there's gonna be another municipal election, uh, both for the transit line, as well as the amalgamate or the, the city policing. So I think in the next election, that's really where that's gonna be. A, it's almost gonna be a referendum on those two things, uh, which is, I guess, good, but it's also too bad because there are a thousand other decisions that should be sort of debated during a municipal election as well. Evie, did you wanna? I'll just add to that. We keep talking about how messy politics are, municipal politics, and I think it has gotten messier. And I think when I was preparing for today too, I was thinking one of, you know, I've, it's been brought up a little bit, but what I really see as a big disadvantage of major amalgamation is the civic engagement, which is what makes things messy. Um, I, I think, for example, the situation in Surrey, I think if the public really doesn't want to have this uh, change of police force, I think there's going to be a lot of pushback and I think they will have to capitulate. Um, so whether he wants to have community engagement and consultation or not, he's going to hear it. <laughs> he's going to get it. Um, so that's what I really think. That's what makes it so great that, you know, people are engaged. I've never, when you think back, it wasn't that long ago, municipal politics was pretty sleepy. Uh, you didn't have, you know, nights where you were... You know, you had a list of 70 people for a public hearing. It was, you know, it was very, very sleepy. And people are really engaged now. And I think that's a really good sign. Okay. On that happy note, um, I'll ask you to hold on to your questions um, for the afternoon. And I'll thank our panelists very much. Thank you.